if you've ever seen any of the shows on the media, the religious leaders who, who push out their points of view on the media in our society, they say, you'll be blessed, as long as you give us some money. Uh, that's the bottom line of the message. And that's the kind of message that goes out there. And I have seen some of those shows myself. And the clear message is, if you give us the money, Jesus Christ and God will return those blessings to you. Now, I want to say right at the start, that is not our line. It is not certainly what Jesus Christ promised at all. And we want to see this evening in detail what he did promise. And it's far, far greater, in fact, than anything that we could receive in this day and age as far as material things are concerned. We want to look at the words of Jesus. We're going to stay within the four Gospels and go across to Revelation, see exactly what Jesus said and what he has promised to those who would follow him. Here's probably a fundamental point. You come with me to Luke chapter 5 and verses 18 to 20. He can forgive our sins. That was why he came to this world. John the Baptist, when he introduced him to the Jewish people, said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that's exactly the message here in Luke chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. We read there, Behold, they brought in a bed a man that was taken with a palsy. Sought means to bring him in and to lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find by which way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop, let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, that's a strange thing to say. I mean, they came to have this man healed. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. That's obviously a promise that he gave to that person, a promise that he makes, in fact, to all of us. And those who are there, the sceptic said, it says in verse 21, who, who's speaking blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? When Jesus perceived in verse 22, he answering said to them, What are you thinking in your hearts? What is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? But in verse 24, that you might know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he turns and says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go to thy house. And immediately he rose up and did so. So friends, a very simple miracle. A miracle which must have staggered those people that were there. Clearly the man was unable in any way to, to walk or, or do anything. He had to be brought there on that couch. And Jesus takes that opportunity to say, not I'm going to heal this man, but I have the power to forgive sins. They said, what are you on about? Well, if I can make this man get off of that couch, then that is absolute proof that God has given me, Jesus, the power and the ability to forgive sins. Now, friends, we started with that one because although it may not seem to be to you perhaps terribly important, it actually is absolutely fundamental to our well-being. Because the Bible clearly tells us the wages of sin is death. We all know that that's a certainty in the life of every one of us. And God tells us that we go to that grave because we do wrong things. Because we do wrong things, we all of us end up in that grave. Now, if the Son of God can reverse our sins, then he can reverse that situation in the grave. 
And that's why the power of that miracle is there in that record. He had the power to heal that man to prove that he can forgive our sins. So there's our first promise, and it's a, a very, very dramatic and fundamental one when you think about it. If he can forgive our sins and reverse eventually what will end up to every one of us and bring us back to life again, then that surely is a great and a wonderful promise. And so he does offer us eternal life. That's the next step in respect to forgiveness of sins. You look at these passages here, Matthew 19 and verse 29. These are almost all of them I'm choosing the words of Jesus himself. So these are things that he has personally promised to those who will take the option up. Matthew 19 and verse 29. He says, Everyone that's forsaken houses and brethren and sisters and fathers and mothers and wife and children and lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall receive or inherit everlasting life. That's really the reverse of what we started with, isn't it? He's not saying to actually to, to pay over anything, but if we have been for his namesake caused to lose those things, don't worry, he said, God will cause us to inherit eternal life. You come to the Gospel of John, which has quite a lot to say about that as well. John 3 and verse 16. Words that are well known, I think, to people familiar with their Bibles, but they have a essential core teaching here that's important for every one of us. God so loved the world, says John, or recording at least uh, things that Jesus had taught. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, very, very clear promises. That's why God sent Jesus Christ to this earth 2,000 years ago, why he was born of Mary, why he came into existence then, so that he might, as John said, cause the sins of the world to be taken away as the Lamb of God. And as he says here in verse 16, that whosoever believes in him should have everlasting life. Chapter 6 and verse 27, again, we have those words repeated. This time, Jesus says them himself. These are the words of Jesus in John 6 and verse 27. He has just, in fact, uh, fed 4,000 and the disciples and many, many people are following him, seeking another miracle like that. And he draws the lesson of it in verse 27. He says... Don't labour for the meat, food that perishes, but for that which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the Father sealed. So he says, don't labour, don't spend all your effort upon material things. He knew full well that we have to do that from day to day to merely exist in this life. But he says, don't labour for that which perisheth. Don't put all your attention into those things, but rather into that which endures to everlasting life, which I, the Son of Man, shall give unto you. Chapter 11, he repeats that same message in verses 25 and 26, if we go across to there. This is a chapter where Jesus is about to raise Lazarus, one of his dear friends with Mary and Martha. Lazarus had died. Mary and Martha call him to them and remonstrate with him as to why he couldn't have come earlier. And he didn't do that so that he might raise Lazarus from the dead. And there's this little dialogue between Martha and Jesus before that happens. Because Martha says to uh, Jesus in verse 24, look, I, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. There he is, he's dead, he's buried, 
You're telling me you're the resurrection of the life. I, I know that he will be raised in the last day. That's going to happen later. And verse 25, Jesus says, Yes, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He didn't actually mean he should, never, he should never die in the sense that he wouldn't lose his life at the moment, but he would not remain forever dead. And Martha and he had this little dialogue. He actually proves what he's saying by going a little later on and raising Lazarus. But our interest here is in verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in me, says Jesus, and I promise you, even though you may die, you shall live again. And those two points we've made here are very much connected. Because he is able to forgive our sins, because he was the Lamb of God that gave his life for each one of us, he can also offer us eternal life. And that's what he's clearly saying there in verse 25. If you believe in me. And we'll cover that point as we get along a little bit further. And what does he promise us with that eternal life? Well, he's going to give us a kingdom here upon the earth. John 14, coming, staying in John there and looking at verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> Let's just read these verses first of all. John 14, 1 to 4. He says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me, believe, believe in God, and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going, he said, and he shortly did. He died and was resurrected. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, he says, and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Whither I go, you know, and the way you know. But, and then the disciples are puzzled by his statements here and the rest of the chapter continues in that discourse but I want you to notice the promise he gives there in verses 2 and 3 shortly I'm going to be crucified and I'm going away to prepare a place for you now that place is not in heaven if we were to stop at verse 2 you might say oh well okay there's all these dwelling places up there in heaven where God is Certainly God is in heaven. He says, in my father's house, there's many mansions or dwelling places and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. But that doesn't say that we're going there. It actually says in the next verse, he's going to bring it back to us. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So what we have now is Jesus in heaven, preparing, as it were, an abiding place for all those who believe in him. And he has promised in verse 3, he will come again, so that all of us together may dwell in that place, his father's house, which is going to be set up upon the earth. But it doesn't say that in those verses, does it? But it does in the other verses we're going to look at here. Luke chapter 18, 28 to 30. So Jesus is now in heaven, awaiting his return to bring his household together into the kingdom of God upon the earth. Luke 18, verses 28 to 30. <clears throat> Peter said, We have left all and followed thee. And he said to them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, parents, brethren, wife, children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more, lots more, in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. In the world to come, 
life everlasting. Where is that world to come? Where is this mansions and dwelling places that Jesus Christ is preparing, his household, that he's going to draw together when he comes again in this world to come, when a life everlasting shall be given, where is that going to be? Well, Jesus wrote the book of Revelation. Let's go to chapter 11 and verses 15 to 18 because he tells us very clearly in this book where that abiding place is. It is here on the earth, generally called the kingdom of God in the Old Testament and the New, and he says, tells us that story there in Revelation 11, verses 15 to 18. If you weren't aware of it, you can check back at chapter 1, and this is the whole book of Revelation was spoken by Jesus Christ, given to John the Apostle. And so what we are reading in all of this book are the words of Jesus. And he says in verse 15, The seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, that's our world, friends, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So it's an everlasting kingdom and it's going to be comprising the kingdoms of this world. They're going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, of God and of Jesus Christ. So in the words of Jesus here, the nations of this world are going to submit to his reign and he's going to then cause those abiding places and mansions that he promised in John 14 to be opened up to all those through the centuries that have believed in him. Now verse 18, the nations of naturally are going to be angry but God's wrath and Jesus' wrath is going to come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great. And notice these words, friends, because they're very, very appropriate to our day and age. And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And if ever we are living in a time when we could say that Mankind is destroying our habitation. It would have to be in this 21st century. Never before has man the capacity to destroy the earth with atomic weapons and all those things, but even apart from all of that, man's destroying our very environment with the way of life which we have in this 21st century. God's going to change all of that. It says here he's going to destroy them which are destroying the earth. And our society is going to turn right back away from the age that we know today and back into a much simpler and more God-centred and earth-centred way of life than it certainly is today. So there's his third promise. He will give us the kingdom of God and that kingdom is certainly, as he said here, comprising the kingdoms of this world, becoming his kingdom on the basis that he can forgive our sins and can give us eternal life. He promised to give us light. Come to John chapter 8 and verse 12. John's a fascinating book to read, but it's also an enigmatic book. It can be, you have to stop and think about what John says. He, he doesn't necessarily say it in plain language. And here is uh, one of those things that Jesus said that John records. John 8 and verse 12. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We won't go into the interesting details of this chapter which center around those ideas, but just take that thought there in verse 12. I am the light of the world. And he says, he that follows me shall not walk in darkness. Now, that is probably self-evident when you think about it, because darkness is at the end of the day, the absence of light. Okay? Light and darkness cannot be in the same space together. 
If there is no light, there is darkness. But once light comes in, there is no darkness. Well, that's just a natural fact of life. We've all experienced that. We wake up in the middle of the night, forget to turn the light on, and stub our toes and do all things like that till we turn the light on. And then we can see what is around us. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I am the light of the world. When you understand me and my message and what that is all about, then you'll no longer stumble around and walk in darkness because you'll have the light of life. So although that's a very simple kind of statement, it does in a simple way tell us what Jesus is all about. Now what he says, what he does, the message that he gives in this book the whole of the Bible, in fact, is like a light and it dispels misunderstanding, misrepresentation, darkness, all those fumbling things which we so often can get involved in. Jesus and the word of life can dispel that darkness and show us the way ahead. It can say, this is a good way to walk. This is the way, says God, I want you to walk. Here is the light of my countenance. This is in this book here. I am the light of the world. You walk this way and you won't have all the difficulties of stumbling around in the dark. John chapter 3 and verses 3 to 6. He actually says that part of that process is to be born again. John 3 and verses 3 to 6. Again, I invite you to read the entire chapter because it's about a discourse between one of the rulers of the Jews, Nicodemus, and between him and Jesus. And Jesus says to this ruler in verse 3, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now we've seen before that he's promised that kingdom, he's promised light, And he says here to Nicodemus, to all of us in fact, if you're not born again, you can't see that kingdom. Now Nicodemus' reaction was probably like we would have been, I'm already here, how can I be born again? That's exactly what he says in verse 4. How can a man that's born when he's old, can he go into his mother's room again? He's thinking of course, at the natural level. Of course, the answer is no, that's an impossibility. Jesus is not talking at that level. Jesus says in verse 5, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus does not explain in the verses that follows exactly what he means he gives some hints but he is really asking us to lift our minds above the natural level and say sure we can't go back into our mother's womb but if we're going to see the kingdom of God we have to in a sense start all over again we've got to be born again we've got to think differently our lives might have been going in this direction And now because of what I am saying to you, says Jesus, and the word of God is saying to you, I have to turn my thinking around. I've got to rethink my whole life. What am I here for? Ask the big questions. What am I here for? What is the purpose of life? And Jesus says, if you want that kingdom, if you want the answer to those big questions, You've got to turn around, be born again and think through what I am saying to you. And the keys are born of water and born of spirit. And we're not going to develop those this evening. Essentially he is saying you've got to turn around, repent, be baptised of water, show a new direction entirely in your life And when I come, I will give you my spirit and everlasting life. And then you can go into the kingdom of God. You'll then be born of water with your mental change and your act of baptism. 
and change physically when I come again and take you into my kingdom. That would take us a whole night to fill all of that out. He just says that to Nicodemus in those couple of words. Nicodemus, as a ruler of the Jews, you're on the wrong tram, got to get off of there, turn around, think your whole position, because you've got to go in a different direction if you want the kingdom of God. And that's no different to us in this generation either. We have to think about those big questions, where we're going, what is the purpose of life? Jesus will give us those answers. He says, I can make you free. John 8 and verses 30 to 36. These words again have been misconstrued in many ways, but he does promise a freedom in John 8. Again, read the whole chapter and you'll see the context of these words. We'll just take the essence of them now. John 8 and reading from verse 30. He spake these words, many believed on him. And Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. Now there's certain basic evidence in that itself, isn't there? To know the truth, there is a certain freedom in that. We know that something is true, and we can see that other things are not, and there's a a release from those things which are not so. But what's he talking about here? Verse 34. Jesus said, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. In fact, it's actually a slave of sin. The slave abides not in the house forever, but the son does. If the son therefore makes you free from that bondage of sin, you shall be free indeed. And that's the essence of what he is promising here in verse 36. He says, every one of us is a bondage to sin. We are born that way. It's not as though we can do anything about that. We are born into that condition. And he says, I can make you free from that condition. That if you follow me, follow my principles, follow the truth, as he said in those earlier words, that will make you free from the enslavement of sin, from the enslavement of doing those things which we naturally will do, that our desires will lead us to do. The Bible will say to us, this is a better way. Think about this way. Go in this direction. And that will make you free from the bondage of your own lusts and your own desires. He says, however, we have to turn around. I've been saying that and that's what Luke says if we come to chapter 13 and verses 1 to 5. There has to be a repentance. There has to be a thinking upon our way of life and a turning around if that is going to happen. And there is a story here in this chapter. We'll just pick the thread of it up. Jesus said to uh, them in verse 2, suppose you these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things. There was this particular case in verse 1 where certain Galileans had been slain. And Jesus said, well, were they worse than the others? And he says in verse 3, no, they, but except you repent, all of us will perish. Or those 18, he says in verse 14, which is something they must have known about, upon whom the tire of Siloam fell and slew them, they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem. He says, no, except ye repent, then you shall likewise perish. So there is a key ingredient. He says, natural disasters happen. That's what he's saying in those verses 1 to 4. Natural and also ones where men interfere and oppress other people, they happen all over the place. They happen in his time, they happen in our time. Or those people any worse than other people upon the face of the earth? No, they're not. He says, all of us need to repent. Every single one of us needs to look at our life, see where we're going, ask those big questions and turn around. Luke 15, the whole of this chapter is on that point there. It's the parables of the lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin. 
and the lost son. And the whole message is in those three verses there, 7, 10 and 32. It says in verse 7, There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. In verse 10, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And verse 32, It was meet, says the father to his other son, that we should make Mary and be glad, or well, this thy brother was dead, he's alive again and was lost, but is now found. The message, repentance. There is a need to look at our lives, ask ourselves where we're going, does it match up to the principles of this book? And for most of us that means turning around, doesn't it? Changing our way of life. And that's the message of Luke chapter 15. Matthew 11 and verses 28 and 30. Jesus Christ promised us rest. Matthew 11 and verses 28 to 30. Not rest in the sense of not labouring, but rest from the weariness and the depression and the fearfulness of our mental state from time to time. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come to me, he says, all that labour and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, I am lowly and meek in heart, and you shall find rest, what to? Into your souls. And that's what he is promising, my dear friends, a, a rest to our souls. A rest in the frame of mind in which we approach our life. Our life might be difficult, tricky, all sorts of problems, physical and mental or whatever, but he will give us rest unto our souls. The difficulties might still be there. In some cases they will be because that may be the will of God, but he can give contentment and peace and direction and rest to our mental state. And every one of us needs that. Verse 30, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You're not saying life is easy and you'll have no problems or no difficulties. We're going to see that he doesn't, he says the very reverse. But if we take it as his yoke, he will give rest to our souls and whatever we have to endure, we know the end result will be final rest in the kingdom of God. And when we look back upon our life, we will agree with him that his yoke was easy, his burden was light and the more we're able to cast off our own ways and take on his ways, we will understand the peace of mind and the rest that can come into our souls. He doesn't promise an easy life. Matthew 10, 34 to 39. It says, in fact, just the reverse. Think not, he says in verse 34, that I am come to send peace upon earth I am not come to send peace, but a sword. I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother's-in-law. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. Jesus doesn't want that, friends, but that is what has happened in the world. It is what has happened because of his teachings. Why? Verse 37 he that loveth father, mother, is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not up his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. And those words in verse 39 are terribly significant. If we find our life now, if we spend all our waking moments 
striving for that great position, that job, that satisfaction, that whatever it might be in this life, then Jesus says, we will actually lose our life. The richest person upon the face of the earth that achieves the most that is possible in this world. When they get to 90 or 100 or if they reach that far, what have they got? The box in the ground. You have to be realistic, friends. It doesn't matter what we achieve in this life. He says there in verse 39, he that finds his life, whatever we achieve in the greatest sense in this world, in the end, that life finishes in the grave. But he says to every one of us, he that loses his life for my sake, you change direction, you do what I wish you to do, then you will actually find life and you'll be in that kingdom that I am promising you here. He promises to support us. He doesn't say all this and say, well, go to it, you're on your own. Our reading tonight, Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. He gives us this assurance. As David said in the Psalms, I've never seen those who walk in right ways seeking bread. God will supply the basics of life. Luke chapter 12 and verse 22 through to 32. We won't read all of that now. We read it together this evening. But the essence is in verse 22. He says, look, don't take thought for your life, what you shall eat, for the body what you shall put on. For rather, he says in verse 28, if God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Seek not what you will eat in verse 29, neither be of doubtful mind. All these things in verse 30, the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that ye have need of these things. He's not saying don't work, and don't labour, that we might provide for ourselves and our family, but don't take anxious thought about those things. For your father knows you have need of those things. But verse 31, rather seek the kingdom of God and he makes this promise. If we seek the kingdom of God, then all these things shall be added unto you. There's the list of promises that we have seen from the mouth of Jesus Christ. He'll forgive our sins. He's promised us immortality in the kingdom of God upon the earth. He can enlighten our steps. He will cause us to be born again of baptism and immortality eventually. He can free us from the endless cycle of sin. He can help us to repent. He will free us in our minds and give rest to our souls, not necessarily to our bodies, not necessarily to the way of life that we may have to endure, but within his, his yoke, is easy and his burden is light and he will give rest to our mental state. But he doesn't promise an easy life, but he does promise to support each one of us. Now that's fine. What then does Jesus expect of you and I? Let's just start at the beginning. Mark chapter 16, verses 16, uh, 15 and 16. Here's the words of Jesus to his disciples, but they contain the core of his message to us this evening. He said to his disciples in verse 15 of Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to everybody. And what about that? Well, anyone who believes that gospel and is baptised will be saved. Now there's his basic promise. That's what he wants of us. What is that gospel? Believe that gospel. Be baptised and Jesus says, you will be saved. Two important issues there. Understanding and believing the gospel and then being baptised, which we won't go into the detail of that now. But what is this gospel? Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. 
We need to go now to the disciples of Jesus. If he sent them out to the world to preach the gospel, that was his basic message we saw in Mark 16. Well, what did they say? Acts 8 and verse 12, here's Philip. If you read through the rest of the chapter, coming to the Samaritans, and here's what he preached to them. They believed Philip preaching what? The things concerning the kingdom of God, here it is again, Father's house upon earth of many mansions, and the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptised. So the first element is the name of Jesus Christ. If you were to go to Acts 2.28, the same message is there. The name of Jesus Christ is the forgiveness of sin. So Philip preached to those Samaritans, to, to any of us who would care to look into these things, that first component, Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world. The second part, he preached to them the kingdom of God. As we've already seen, he promised that kingdom upon the earth to those who would believe in him. Come back to Acts 3, verses 19 and 20. This is how the disciples spoke about that kingdom in the gospel message. We'll see again some of the elements we've already touched on this evening. Repent and be converted. That's a, a first necessity. If we're going to come to the light of Jesus Christ to dispel the darkness, we've got to turn around our life, totally turn that around, that your sins might be forgiven or blotted out, which is what Jesus has promised. And when's that all going to happen? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached before to you, whom now in the heavens, he is, in verse 21, the heavens must receive him until the restitution of all things that all of his the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Now, there's a lot of thoughts in there, but what Peter is saying is repent, be baptised, and God is going to send Jesus back to the earth again, things which have been spoken about in the Old Testament since the world began, and he's going to establish then the kingdom of God upon the earth with Jesus as king. Now, friends, that's a very simple message, but that's essentially what Jesus has promised to each one of us. All of those things, if we're prepared to understand and believe the gospel and then to be baptised into Jesus Christ. He's made great and realistic promises. They're realistic promises. They're not fairy tales. They relate to real things, to our lives, each one of us, that we, difficulties we face every day can be answered through the power of the word of God as taught by Jesus Christ. And we certainly invite you to explore that detail with us further in time to come.